Hey, folks. Uh, <clears throat> people will be streaming it, I'm sure, for a bit here. Uh, Brian is in charge today, so we're going to let him uh, run us through all that. So uh, I'm still here if we run into any kind of issues or anything like that, but I'm mostly just going to hang back um, and handle chat and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, figure we'll give it a little bit more time for people to stream in there, but then just head off whenever you want, Brian. Cool, cool. Well, we're getting a couple minutes. Seen any good movies? I haven't seen any good movies, but that sweater is amazing. Thank you. You know, it actually gets better. It has a front pocket. Like a hoodie, but it's got no hood. It's just unstoppable. That's both worlds right there. Mm-hmm. I miss the uh, Value Village in Crown Hill. What are we talking about? Movies. I watched Alien again. Did you know that movie was like in SIF? Like it like debuted at like the Seattle International Film Festival in really 78 or 79, whenever. Yeah. It's incredible. I thought so too. Big shout to Sigourney Weaver. Best like tension buildup of almost any movie ever. I mean, you go the first entire half of the movie without seeing the creature. That like slow building pressure and tension, those like sequel. I mean, I, every time I rewatch it, I'm just sort of blown away by it. Mm -hmm. I saw John Wick, the first one, for the first time. The John Wick movies are fascinating. How long did we have to endure Jason Bourne before we got to John Wick? John Wick has the best subtitles of any movie. Oh, like the, the closed captions? Yeah, because it like emphasizes words. Like they'll be like, oh, you know, they call him the Baba Yaga. And like Baba Yaga will like turn on fire. It's very cool. The style of it is the thing I think that's like blew me away the first time I watched like when John Wick thing. It's just it's got this like very cohesive style and world that they don't explain in the first movie, which just makes it a gem. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's enough uh, pontificating about nerdy movies. Um, we're here for a specific reason. This reason. So let me open up what the homework is. Oh, Chuck, can you make me a co-host, please? There you go. Appreciate it. All right, cool, 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 cool. This is what you're all looking at. Homework five. RMD had no troubles uh, getting to this stage. Okay, so the plan is we're just gonna crawl through the homework. We're just doing the part one, which is the homework for this week. Um, yeah, shout outs in the chat. If you got any questions, just unmute your mic and say what's up. If there's anything else, let's get going. So first things first, I don't even care what the homework is. I'm loading tidyverse. I'm a simple man with simple needs. Oh, I also want to say, um, if your R Studio is not um, configured like mine to have the console over here, I'm sorry. I always put it over here because it's easier for me to read. I almost never look in my environment, you know. Okay, so I'm just gonna run that. Got tidyverse going for while we're crunching through the homework. Let's see what the instructions say. They say, instructions, questions for you to answer are as quoted blocks of text. Put your code used to address these questions and interpretations below each block. Make sure your answers are not, are not in block quotes like these. Load all libraries you want to use in the setup chunk. When you discover you want to use a library later, add it to the setup chunk at the top. You will turn in part one for the coming week and part two for the following week. 
This week's already here. This is part one. That's this week. Um, you'll upload the entire template each time with whatever progress you've made. Cool. So part one, getting the data in. Download the data from here. There's a plain text file of data, about 60 megabytes in size. Values are separated with commas. You can see this by opening it with a good text editor, editor like Adam or Sublime. Not Notepad. Don't do Notepad. Notepad++, plus plus, not Notepad. Save it in the same folder as this template. Read the file into R. You'll want to use the cache equals true chunk option for this and potentially other chunks. Um, cache equals true will allow R to read the file only once to save time. Okay. Um, goodness. I'm sorry, y'all. I took an L. I did not do as this instructed, and I did not save it into this directory. I'm so sorry. So I'm going to cheat real quick. I'm going to just do this. And that's going to take a second. And there we go. So I have that. Don't do what I did. I'm sorry. Okay, so inspecting the data. Um, we're gonna use the glimpse function to look at the data, describe the data in their current state, how many rows are there, what variables are there, what kind of values do they take? Don't list them all, there are many. Are the columns sensible? I think these are all good questions to ask. Let's see, we say glimpse, entirety of the data, what do we get? Let's see, we have 643,000 rows. That's a lot. We have nine columns. Not a ton, but you know, we're working. Um, we have some column called precinct, it's character. Race is also character. We have leg CC and CG that are all double. Let's keep that in mind. Counter group is a character, party, sure. Counter types also character, sum of count is a double. So I'm already thinking all of these double things, I'm sort of unsure whether or not these are real numbers or some sort of factor. Um, and the character things just kind of is what they are. So, hmm. Chuck, should I just answer these kinds of questions here or should I just do all the maths? all of the stats things. You can. I mostly sort of usually talk about them. So um, you basically kind of talked about it there. You don't necessarily have to fill the stuff in. It's sort of like, yeah, their job to do a little bit of writing here and there. Um, I would sort of just say discuss these things as you go. And so you'll walk through each one of the variables and sort of chat about them. And folks can take their own notes of whatever they want as you go. Bet. Thanks. OK, so let's review what questions we have. How many rows? We address that. What variables are there? We address that. What kind of values do they take? A bunch of doubles, no shouts. Um, are the column types sensible? Sensible enough. I mean, looking at it, I can tell it's administrative data and that we're going to have things to think about later. But right now, we're moving. So in addition to looking generally, look at each variable individually except consider leg CC and CG at the same time. I'll tell you now that these three aren't likely to be useful to you, but maybe guess what they are. Okay. <laughs> we'll get to play a fun guessing game later, y'all. Um, remember, these are real administrative data, so they may be really strangely structured. Yeah, I'm, I have no doubts already. Um, and some variables are indecipherable. In real world data work, you often have to get by with intuition or poking around online with regard to the nature of your data. Here are useful ways to look at 10 unique values of individual columns given some data and a variable of interest. So we could say with our data, and then we get all of our distinct unique values for some variable, and then give me the first 10 rows. So we'll be doing that for a lot of our character variables. Um, another thing you might want to do is get the frequency or the count of all of our distinct values where we would do our data 
and then count for some variable, which again will probably be a character. So let's get started doing that. We, ooh, we have our data. Oh, we're going to type it. And let's see, precinct. We can count precincts. Oh, 2,517 rows. Yeah, they're right. They're right. I mean, look at all this. This is too much. I don't need to look at all that. Let's just look at the bottom 10. Okay, we have some precinct names with some sort of designation here. And there are 243 rows associated with that particular precinct name. Cool. A uh, question. Yes. I just want to see the ones, for example, that start with M. Just the precincts that start with M? Yeah. OK. Um, let's think. Which way should we do this? I think that we could. This is how I'm going to do this because this is the first way that came to mind, but I don't know if this is the best way to do this. I would make a new column and I would say this is M precincts. And then I would say if else string detect use substring. Oh, yeah, we haven't covered stringer yet. Okay. So we could, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, substring. I don't remember quite how substring works. So we need a character vector, so that's gonna be precinct. And we need a start, so that's, that's probably just gonna be one. And the end is, stop, nothing, is going to be also one. And, And we can say equals equals just M, right? And if that's true, give me a one. And if it's not, give me a zero. And then I'm gonna filter M precincts equals equals one. And so let's say we have 105 uh, precincts that start with one, and if we just click through here, they all seem pretty Mabel and Madison and Maple Hills and Marshall and then Maury. Shout out to Maury. Sorry, can you go over like all the things in the um, substring, like what each of those uh, components are? Sure. So Chuck might have to correct me if I'm wrong because I don't use substring. But I'm pretty sure what I've done here is that I am cutting down this string that I'm feeding it here. So I'm giving it this column precinct. So it's reading each one of the things in that column. I've asked it to only read the first uh, character in that string. Um, so I said start on the first one and also stop on the first one. And then if that thing that you're reading is the same as this uh, string that I'm giving it, just a capital M, then give me a one in that column. And if it is not equal to the string M, then give me a zero. Um, and then I now have a column that says, if it has an M in it, it's a one. And so I filter to just the things that are one for this new column. Does that make sense? I see. So the one L stands for like the end of a column. Um, yes. So like if we said um, like two here, it would read the first two characters. Um, and it would always give me a zero because it's not going to equal n or just one m. But 
I yeah. see, I see. And an important thing to note is that L is optional there. That just indicates this is an integer. So you can have it with or without the L. OK. I was skeptical about that. This was a thing that I intuited. I often, when I'm using string things, put in L. And I just didn't think about it that hard. It's not that. Shout out to Precinct MV. Yeah, all my homies up in MV. OK, cool. So we also have race. I'm actually, I'm forgetting if race was one of our doubles. So I'm going to go to the console and type glimpse, my bad, glimpse king raw race. I'm, I'm a caveman. There we go. So race is also one of our characters. I'm so sorry. Um, so we can do count race and give me the first 10 of those. Great. So for the advisory vote 14 race, 15,000 of those we have them. <laughs> I'm still not quite sure. Um, what a particular row means in the raw King County data, but we'll get there. So by looking at this, though, it should give you a little bit of an idea about what, what are in these data. So one thing you could also do is do a head on King raw just to look at a couple rows. And then that will put this in context, too. So if you do like head King raw, like let's uh, throw that up right there. Yeah, we'll look at it. So what you guys probably see immediately, right, is that precinct there, Adair, has a whole bunch of rows for it. Like right now, we see only six of them. But notice even for advisory vote 14, there's a whole bunch of rows for that. So look what actually differs across these rows, right? What differs across these rows? Counter type. Yeah, and an account associated with it, right? The sum account over there. So what would you guess a single row of this data is? And this is this goes out to not just the class, but you know, Priya could answer it too. So what does the number 183 there mean? 183 people like voted to maintain the advisory vote 14. In the precinct to dare. That's what a row of data is in here. It's a count of votes associated with some particular county. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I have a question in the chat. Uh, Nicole Casanova, do count and distinct accomplish the same thing? Kind of. The count does take distinct into account when it does it. So let me show you. So when we have King raw um, and do distinct race. So what we'll get is just like the first unique values that we see in the race column. But what count does, it actually groups by all each of one of these distinct uh, race names and then counts how many rows it has of per each of these distinct things. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. So it sounds like that one makes it kind of more organized and easier to digest when you look at it. Yes, I'd say so. Because um, you could even say, like, count is actually skipping a step of doing where it's like more explicitly saying that we're grouping by each of the things in the race column and then counting how many rows there are. Thank you. You know. Cool. Oh, this is the weird one. Leg CC and CG. What did the thing say? Look at each variable individually, except consider leg CC and CG at the same time. I will tell you now, these three aren't like likely to be useful to you, but maybe guess what they are. 
All right, let's give it a go. Raw. What would you like to do? Should we count by all three of the things? That seems like a good start. They're doubles. I mean, maybe we should just get a summary of what they are. They might be numbers. Oh, my bad. I should have selected. Okay, so for this leg column, we have 43, 48 is the highest you can get, one is the lowest you can get, there's 224 missing. Um, CC, the lowest you can get is one, the highest you can get is nine, there's 224 missing from there. There's no missing for CG, the highest is also nine and the lowest is also one. None of these values for the min or the max or the median or the first quartile are partial values. There's no decimals, there's no fractions. So that's already sort of tipping me off that this mean might actually be meaningless. Um, so we could What do y'all think? What do these things mean? <laughs> I have a theory, but I, I want to hear what y'all are thinking this leg and CC and CG might mean and why they're numbered. Leg is legislative district, CC is county council district, and CG is congressional district. Yeah, that's way better than what my, whatever my theory was. I'm in on that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's basically on target for that. Yeah, it's they're, they're numbered districts of different kinds for different types of elections. So those are the things that determine essentially like um, what uh, judges you vote for, which representatives you vote for and stuff. So those are attached to the potential things people could be voting on. But there's all these different overlapping geographies in here. So there's precincts, but there's also these districts which contain multiple precincts or parts of precincts and things like that. So um, it's kind of, yeah. I see, that would increase the amount of rows. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's messy. Okay. <laughs> um, for clarification, the reason I think that that would increase the amount of rows is because let's say we have a precinct called A and there are legislative district one and two in it. That means they would give a row for each one of those things, even though the vote that we're interested in is only at the precinct level. Does that make sense? In the data you're looking at now, there's luckily no multiple observations per precinct, but in general, yes, that could be a problem. Okay, thank goodness. I always assume the worst when it comes to administrative data. Okay, so we have counter group. I'm in the eighth congressional. Dude, I don't know what congressional district I'm in. I'm not a bad citizen, I don't vote in the state. <laughs> oh, okay. But I have once again forgotten what counter group is. So I'm going to glimpse again. Counter group is a character. So why don't we just do what we've been doing with characters? We're going to do King Raw. We're going to count counter group. And um, let's just give me the first 10. Do y'all see a problem here? I see a problem here. 
This is a tibble that's one by two. There's only one row here. I love these data so much. <laughs> They're a mess. Okay, so this means that the only possible answer in the counter group column is the word total. And that it has the exact amount of observations that we have in our data is the length of it because it's just the word total 643,163 times. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete this part. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is one of those things you get with real administrative data. You get columns that contain literally no information. Every value in the data set for counter group is just total. It tells you each row is a total. Nothing else exists in the data. So there's nothing that's not a total, but at least you know they're totals. Yeah, I don't know about I don't know about all that. I who is using it? Who wants this? Okay, sorry. The, um, yeah, because normally when you read the glimpse, you're like, okay, advisory for, vote 14, advisory four. So I thought total, 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 oh, surely there's something else, there's not. Good to know, good to know. Okay, party is, that one's probably pretty cool. We can probably just, um, distinct party with a capital P yeah and yeah there's 17 rows we can see the whole thing um, does that not print out the whole thing okay. if you feed it directly to print and tell it a number it will do it so if you pipe it into print and do like n equals 20 it should show them all okay Remove the comma. Remove the comma. Yep. 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 I guess you, you, our student is not configured to do the larger uh, prints. That's fine. You could do, it would work in the console. Yeah, it would. Yeah. So we've got no party, probably Democrat, Libertarian, Republican, Green Party. You lost me. I'm, I'm done. Cool, cool, cool. The party distinguishing is actually important, but we'll get there in a bit. Okay. Um, let's see, counter type. Counter type was also a character. Cool, cool. So if we count these, ooh, okay, some of these are names, which suggests to me that they're candidates of some kind. Some of these are just words like approved. What else do we got here? And then what is sum of counts? Would that just signify how a voter voted? Well, these are like individual rows for a type of outcome, like what they voted for, yeah. So that means that it'll be that our data, so if we go back to like Ed King Raw, so counter type would be, but this counter type says maintained registered voters repealed times blank voted times counted. Think carefully about it and look how the number for times counted relates to the other numbers you see in, in that particular precinct. Times counted 
485. Yeah, so this is, this data needs to be turned sideways eventually is what <laughs> counter type is telling me. <laughs> yeah, so like times counted seems to me like, yeah, like it's the total votes. I agree with you, Katie. But the, yeah, because if it's 485 and then 519 for registered voters, that sounds like pretty good turnout. Yeah, so if you count it up, so look at 183 plus 251 plus 51. You can even just type it in console and get it. 183 plus 251 plus 51, 485. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that means that we have little chunks of all the stuff that people voted for, including a row that tells you the total amount of people who voted yeah, that's messy. I wouldn't do that. And another row that tells you how many people could have voted. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Yusuf, you raised your hand. Yeah, sorry. I don't, I, I'm not sure if we have, we're, um, feel free to ignore this if we don't have time to, for sidebar, but I'm just wondering if we could just look at Adam Smith's um, row. Look at Adam Smith's row. But if we don't have time, like it's all good. Like let's just do it. We could do that. We could do king raw um, filter counter type equals equals. So these are all the rows for Adam Smith. Um, so we see we have like the different districts. I guess he was only up and. Congressional District 9. He's a Democrat. Is that cool use? That's super helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Okay. Notice something odd about counter type in particular. It tells you what a given row of votes was for, but it also has registered voters times counted in times. What is times counted? Just went over that. Cool, cool. Sum of count. Okay. Okay. Um, here's an idea. We could do the raw data. And then what if we select the what was the other one? Not counter type. Okay. Yeah. So let's just do. Sorry, I keep getting confused. I I should just get to the screens. I really should. Um, but we're confident, knowing now, having seen times counted, that sum of count tells us something about how many votes there are. So it's probably just like a real numeric thing instead of a double like legislative and CC and CG were. So what would we like to do about that? Let's see the highest sum of count maybe. We could do select sum, sum of count and give it the range in descending order by some. Okay. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that there are 1126 uh, <laughs> things that are called registered voters somewhere. So I'm not feeling super happy with that answer. I feel like that's a weird thing. How about if we just arrange straight up? Oh, I guess that will give us all the rest. Maybe, what else would we wanna know about some account? We could just do select some account and then summary. That'll tell us that in some of the rows we have zero, in some of the rows we have 1126, as we saw before, and that on average, 
whatever is in these has 198.5 votes. Cool. So do you have any questions about sort of doing these descriptive, what are each of these variables telling us? Thanks. Or are we cool to move on? So before we go on, everything was covered there, but it's just good to like think about this process that sort of Brian was just walking through as the sort of thing you'll do when you encounter a new data set. I recommend you look at exactly what you have and you kind of use your intuition and maybe you poke it, poke around at some stuff until you kind of figure out what things are. It can be sometimes hard to figure out exactly what it is you want out of things. It's like, we know we probably want to work with some sort of like counts of votes and stuff, but figuring out exactly how to get that and how the data is represented takes sort of just like staring at each thing independently, but also seeing how they sort of relate to each other in the whole data frame. It's sort of an organic process just like this. So just sort of think about what you've seen here and apply it to your own stuff later on. Filter, kind of type, tables, atom span, range, descending order, and um, you are going to want to count first. If he wants to sort by sum of count the column, replace the n in, in descent with sum of count, if that's what you're after. Cool. Okay. So moving on to the section, the quantities of the interests. We will focus on only the three major executive races in Washington in 2016. So President, and Veep, uh, Governor and Lieutenant Governor. With these races, we're interested in three things. One, the turnout rates. Um, for each of these races in each precinct, we will measure turnout as times voted, as times votes were counted, including for a candidate blank, write in, or overvote, divided by the number of registered voters. Okay. Number two, thing we're interested in for these three races. Differences between precincts in Seattle, like Seattle proper, and precincts anywhere else in King County. Again, these data are not documented, so you will have to figure out a way to do this. That'll be something. And three, the precinct level support for Democratic candidates in King County in 2012 for each contest. Um, we will measure support as the percentage of votes in the precinct for the Democratic candidate out of all votes for candidates or write-ins do not include blank votes or overvotes. And overvotes are where the voter indicated multiple choices. Okay. And the overall vote count for the denominator. So you'll perform the data management for number one and number two in part one. Part two will contain most of the work for number three. Okay. So we're not that worried about this one right now, but we are going to concern ourselves with these two. The goal to accomplish uh, over parts one and two will be to get the data to one row per precinct with the following columns. Uh, precinct identifier, indicator for whether the precinct is in Seattle or not, um, precinct size in terms of registered voters, turnout rate percentage, democratic support for governor, for governor, <laughs> for president, for governor, and lieutenant governor. Um, this section describes the steps you may want to do to get the data organized. Um, and provide some hints and suggestions for methods using tplyr and tidier. Okay, so first we're going to be filtering down the data. For what we want to do, there are a lot of rows that are not, that are not useful, like leg. Um, we only want one pertaining to races for president, governor, and lieutenant governor. So let's trim everything down. You will want to see how these things show up in the data. The easiest way um, may be to one, display every unique value of race and find which ones match our races of interest. Then two, filter the data to those races. Yeah, okay, let's get started with this first part. Display every unique value of race and find which ones, okay. So if we wanted every unique value of race, we would say King Raw and we would say distinct 
place. I want to see them all. So I'm going to pop over here to the console. And Chuck, how do I cheat and show all of them? That print trick I said before. So you go distinct race and then pipe it into print and say like n equals 100. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Alphabetize and it makes it a little easier too. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So we're also going to arrange. Um, great. So we're interested in the president, the governor, and lieutenant governor. There's governor. Whoa. Number 26 here. So let me write that down. Mm. Probably easiest to just use 70. the text. To just use the text. Ooh, Probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rather than the number. But then I'm going to embarrass myself not knowing how to spell lieutenant. We all learn together. Okay. Um, so we I literally copy and paste out of the console myself. Can you like highlight lieutenant governor and just grab it? I copy paste everything. I can't type the same a lot. So we should do um, filter race equals equals um, governor or race equals equals yeah 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 I'm not gonna make a fool of myself today or race equals equals now how do they write down president US president and vice president here okay Appreciate you, Nicole. Okay, so display a reading value of race, find which ones match our races of interest, filter down the data to those. So let's say um, king ROI, ROI being races of interest. And king ROI. Do has 65,000 rows. That sounds pretty solid. That sounds like we cut down quite a bit of our rows, down to like 10% of them now. Um, do king ROI. This is a governor race. Feeling good about that. I'm going to try a tail also so that I can see. Yeah, this is a President and vice president race, I'm feeling good. Um, Chuck said equivalent, but more compact. King raw, and then filter race percent in. Ooh, yeah, yeah. So you're seeing the foibles of social science coding, where I, this was the first answer that got me the answer. So I would just. <laughs> They're basically equivalent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So we filtered down to those. We have that data set. What's next? Um, are we cool with that? You'll see this answer also. I don't want to just keep moving on. See how this answer gets us the same thing. We could even check. King ROI Got the addition. Seems to have the same amount of rows. But let's just say king ROI equals equals king ROI Chuck edition. It'd be a fat print. It printed out a lot. If you do some of that, it will probably return what you want. I see. Or ta ta tab, our table actually. Use table. Yeah, use table. Sleeping on table. Yeah. It's true. Cool. 
Okay, cool. We're moving on to Seattle precincts. Y'all got any questions? Okay. So we want to determine which precincts are in Seattle and which are not. You should look at the values of the precinct variable and see if you can figure out what uniquely identifies Seattle precincts. Hint, all Seattle tracks have the same naming scheme, but some non-Seattle tracks are similar, so be careful. Okay, uh, you will want to create a binary variable that identifies Seattle tracks, for instance, values Seattle, not Seattle. One approach you can use stringer string sub or base substring uh, to grab a number of characters, a substring from text, say to test if they are equal to something. If you use this with if else inside of a mutate, you can make a new variable. I did that earlier. We can do that. But what's the first thing we want to do is look at the values of the precinct variable to see if you can find out what uniquely identifies Seattle precincts. What are y'all thinking? I'm, I'm struggling to think of a way that would make this without doing a bunch of reading. Um, how I did it was, well, I don't know if this is the most conventional way, but I went into um, the variable, like the, the one with the raw variable, and then I just went into some of counts and I figured, well, if it's Seattle, it probably has the most vote counts. So I went there and I saw that it had um, SEA in front of it, and I assumed that those are Seattle precinct. Gotcha. I see. So you did that from the raw data. Do you think we need to still do that if we want to try it here? Can we just use the ROI ones? Let's see. Yeah, let's um, go ahead and do it. Yeah. Let's do a range by sum of count. You want to do descendant. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll say that's one of the most clever ways I've ever heard somebody think of solving this problem. Most of the time you have to like people just browse through the whole list. Thinking about that, that is very clever. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, non-conventional. No, that was, that was innovative. Um, yeah, this seems like Seattle to me. I think we could all agree. SEA, Seattle. What's ISS? Issaquah. Yeah. I see. I don't know where anything is. I haven't left Seattle since I moved here. <laughs> um, there's, a, uh, there's a good way you could figure out if it's actually SEAs for Seattle, because you'd think there'd have to be a lot of them, because Seattle's like a very large chunk of the, the area of uh, King County, which is what these data are for. So you should expect to see a lot of those SEA ones. So when we filter down to the SEA ones uh, or, or create the variable, we can just tabulate it and we would expect to see a lot of them. And that would probably signify to us that we're probably right. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So now that we are comfortable with the SEA solve, we can make our variable and then we can compare. So we want binary variable using substring. Mutate if else. We'll use the base substring again. Um, this time on the precinct column, our start is going to be one. Our stop is going to be three. Yeah. And does this equal equal SEA? And if it does, give me the word Seattle. And if it does not, give me the word Seattle. And then we'll run it. And if we scooch over here, we see that we have this. I did not name that. Oof. 
Is there a correct way to filter based on the precinct name? Um, filter string extract precinct Seattle. You wouldn't want to use string extract for that, but you could use string detect. But you probably want to use SEA or some, maybe not exactly SEA, as we'll see in a minute. Yeah. So I used, I, I'm going to name this variable C flag. And OK, how about we do count C flag. That's not quite right. We expected that this was going to be like way higher than this one. No, not necessarily larger, but a lot of them. In fact, it actually might be slightly higher than it should be. Excuse me? OK. So okay. filter it down to the ones that are C flag and order them by their precinct, and then look at the head and look at the tail. So you're saying filter C flag equals equal Seattle? I'm confused by what you described to do. Yes. And then look at the head, the head. And then look at the tail. So head, this seems like Seattle, governor race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, gotcha. Where is C view? C view? OK. All right. Chuck's playing tricks today. So let's make this four and add a little space here. Are we cool with that? That sounds pretty promising to me. Now the tail does not have C view. And then there's the head. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of these things that we're using to check. And do we need to make a separate data frame for this? Let's determine if they're Seattle or not. So yeah, we're gonna make this one King. Let's see how so that we know that we have saved this column that we made. Do we have any questions about that process that we just fumbled through? This is a good example of something where you'd make that little, <clears throat> that sorting and get the SEA ones and you might go quite a ways down further on and suddenly realize you've got a bunch of extra precincts and you don't want. And luckily, if you're doing this all programmatically like this, all you have to do is go up and change that. And then all the rest of the code would change on it for you because you won't have to modify anything if you've done things in a in like kind of a reliable way. Um, but that's like one of those sneaky ones. When you make like a new variable, something you, that you think is going to separate some stuff, sort it, check the beginning, check the end. One of them, if there's a problem, will probably be visible that way. Wait, I have a question. Can you scroll up a little? Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. So I was, oh, okay. Never mind. Never mind. I, I got it cleared up. So what you're doing here is that you're taking the table from the previous question and then adding a column to it. Yes, I am. Okay, cool. cool, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have registered voters and turnout rates. We want to calculate turnout rates as total votes, including normal votes, blank votes, overvotes, write-ins, for the presidential race divided by registered voters. Um, and we have some cool tech here. Turnout equals total votes divided by registered voters. OK. Um, hint, you will want to look at counter type and sum of count at the same time within each precinct and race. Examine how. The sum of count values for counter type. Um, examine how the sum of count values for counter type value times counted relate to all the other counter type values. Okay. 
how should we approach this? Well, calculate the turnout rates as total votes. So that we can do total votes divided by registered voters. Let's look at our data again. Counter type is useless. I should have just gotten rid of it. Um, let's see. So we have our sum of count in a particular precinct. And we know that we want to count all of the ones that are in there that are not times counted so that we can compare them. Hmm, okay. So we have King C and we want to filter out the, you want to look at counter type some of count at the same time within each precinct and race. Okay, so do y'all think, I'm struggling to come up with a quick answer for this one. It's a multi-stage problem. You'll probably yeah, end up yeah, with yeah. about four or five lines of code. That's what I'm thinking. We want, So the very first thing, yeah. think about exactly what rows you need to calculate the thing that we're after. So what is it exactly that we're after? And then think about what rows are necessary to get that. I'm thinking that we want, um, well, I don't know which counter type rows we want to throw out for sure. What are y'all thinking? I think I tried looking through the data and I was confused on the relationship between all of those variables. So maybe we could sort out the relationship first before writing any code. Okay. Emma says, I use pivot wider for counter type. I see. So you made a column for each of the things in counter type and then we're able to look at across the sum of count. That sounds pretty good. That sounds promising. I'm sorry, but can we see the cat? <laughs> <laughs> she helps me uh, code and write and teach. <laughs> I don't know. I'm thinking that we don't need to, we could. I'll say the pivoting is probably the most elegant way to do it. But before I would pivot, I think about what rows overall that I need. So I don't have to pivot out the entire data frame. Because I was you... thinking it would get big and I didn't, I'm thinking that I would select what columns we want. So we, were, we want precinct and we want race. We want some account and we want counter type. So like already I'm like, we're cutting down to these four columns that we'd like. And then, um, so okay. which race are we interested in? race are we interested in? We're only calculating the turnout rate based on one race, right? Oh, I see. That's where I got tripped up. I didn't know how to read. So I'm happy to just filter 
trace equals equals So we filter down to this, just the president race, the counter type. We don't want some of them. We only want filter counter type equal to times blank loaded, times counted. We don't want times counted. Now think about it in one of two ways. What exactly do we want? We want the total votes, including normal votes, blank votes, overvotes, and write-ins divided by registered voters. There's two ways to get that total. I see, I see Chuck, you're leading a horse to water. So you could then group by already the precinct and the race. I mean, we don't really have to do the race, but, and then summarize the um, turnout Probably not going to get you what you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right away. I, I'm, I'm getting confused. So visualize exactly the minimum pieces of information to calculate what you want. What numbers right now on the screen do you need to calculate that turnout? I feel like I just need times counted and registered voters. Yeah. Reduce it to that. But if Okay, but the Okay, so now we have for each precinct, a row that just has the registered voters and the amount of votes. And what we want to do is, do we need to pivot? It's okay. the easiest way. Yeah. So we want to then get it wider. with, I'm sorry, I always get confused with pivot because I learned spread first. What steps do I take next? So think about it. The, the nice thing about um, pivot is that it actually has like nicely explained arguments. So what do what column do you want to turn into new column names? Um, I would like counter type turned into two columns. So the names come from tap counter type. So names from counter type. Doesn't have to be quoted. It can just be counter type. You can quote it if you want, but it doesn't have to be, just as a heads up. And then is there like a values from argument, which will be count? And then I need? That's wild. Okay. It's actually much easier than gather and spread once you get used to it. I see. I'm I'm so used to the archaic way. And then are we still? Now look there's at the precincts. The, yeah, there's the correct amount already. Yes, we've taken care of all of our problems because you filtered out all extraneous rows and by getting down to only counter type and sum of count, there's or, or times counted and registered voters. There's only one row for times counted and one for registered voters for every precinct. You pivot it out, you have the exact number of precinct row observations. So by doing it sort of this like by emphasizing the tidiness of doing it, you've actually taken care of all of your weird sort of um, messy data problems. And this is so this ends up being a very elegant solution. Yeah, and then you can just add a column that's just turnout, and it's just I'm 
this is sort of an example of, uh, of sort of my favorite thing about doing like social science uh, coding is that generally, um, oh yeah, if you if you have a quoted there, it's not gonna work because it thinks that those are strings and it's trying to do math with them. Um, but uh, this is actually sort of beautiful because this is one of those illustrations where your goal is always to take a hideous data frame like this and turn it into something normal. Once something is in a normal kind of long format, all operations become trivial. So now it's just like, oh, well, turnout's just calculating this column divided by that column. If you had it in the long format, it would be really awkward and weird, but we've made our data tidy and then we can do the operations we want with it. Cool. And that's how you get the exact right answer. Um, <laughs> Katie says, I tried to follow along. I only have one row for C view. What did I do wrong? Probably their substring has the wrong number in it. Scroll up to, uh, um, yeah, here I changed this to four and then added a space here. Let's... Oh, I kept the filter in after that. Now I have zero rows. Yeah, I deleted the things that were under here. Paste your exact code in if you still have it. If you make sure there's no filter statement, but after that, paste in your uh, code and we'll, we'll do it from this chunk. Okay. Give me the prior chunk. Because that works perfectly. It's, it's got to be the prior one. So it should be the one where you create King SEA. Oh, it's fixed. Okay, great. Off the last few parts from the prior, it's fixed. Okay, cool. That's it for part one. <laughs> we did it. Wow. Oh, sorry. Can I ask again how like when when do you know to use no uh, no quotes, no quotation marks? And then when to use backticks? Sure. So the problem I ran into here was that when this was in quotes, it thought that I was trying to do math with two sets of words. And here I'm trying to, it like now in the backticks knows that I'm asking for the columns here instead of trying to do math with words. Um, but the reason that we don't want it to have those quotes as like a rule of thumb is hard for me to verbalize. Chuck, do you think you could? Yeah, it's hard to it? establish it with a, a necessarily with a rule of thumb, um, but it's easier to build an intuition for it, which usually takes some experimentation. The idea with it is um, when are you using, when are you essentially giving R a search term for something is when you kind of quote things, when you're actually referring to a real R object that exists is when you use the unquoted names. Backticks are used whenever there's a space in the name of an object name. In the tidyverse, these things kind of blend together because the tidyverse often lets you use quoted or unquoted names, which is a little bit strange. Um, so you'll kind of build an intuition for it. Um, so for example, what's on the screen right now where it says if else substring precinct uh, from character one to character four equals equals SEA, the SEA over there is literal text. It's not an object named that. Um, but in other cases, you know, you could actually say equals equals SEA not in quotes. And what it would do is R would go and look up an object named that and try and compare equality with the contents of that object. 
So the unquoted variable names refer to something that's stored in your environment where quotes do not. The quoted text is just that text directly. Um, like I said, these things blend and you'll get an intuition for it better than understanding the nitty gritty. And if you in fact start to look at it more technically, we'll actually get much more confusing quickly at first. Okay, I got it. Thank you so much. Um, to Nicole's question. Yeah, we didn't do the uh, examine how sum of count values for counter type value times counted relate to all the other counter type values. I feel like we kind of verbally said that at the end of 196 on bring on screen. Yeah, so Sam's alluding to a pipe that used to be here, but um, let's see. You'll look, you'll want to look at counter type sum of count at the same time. Then each precinct and race examine how the sum of count values for counter type Value times counted is related to. So when we did that earlier example, where like over here I typed in the console, console, how all of the other values added up equals the times counted. Um, I feel like that gets out what this question is. Uh, the idea was we used some intuition, right? We we looked at like uh, King SEA or or something like that. Um, so if you just type King SEA in your console there as the uh, yeah, head will work. Yeah, doesn't matter. Yeah, we don't need to see the first five, I think, or six. Oop. Yeah, so we, oh, actually, it's not wide enough here to see the data I need. Um, so, yeah, that's like, do it in the, yeah, do it right there, and that should uh, do it, King SEA. Okay, not quite. Okay, scroll over one to the right. Yeah, okay, so this is the thing we talked about earlier. So we have all these numbers like J Inslee registered voters times blank voted times counted. We see like 485 for times counted. Well, what's actually going on here is some of the rows for each precinct are actually summary information, and some of them are actual real sort of observations we're interested in. Times counted 485 is equal to the sum of the votes for uh, Jay Inslee, his opponent, blank voted, and write-ins. Um, and so what we did is by knowing that sort of identity to know that this stupid data set contains the sum of all the votes already, we skipped some steps. An alternative to this would be if that times counted rule wasn't there or we didn't know that's what it was, we could instead have manually sort of filtered down to the relevant rows here and summed them all up. So that would be we would drop times counted and registered voters, sum up within each precinct and we get that same number but it's a little bit more of a pain in the ass. So it's easier to know that times counted is there. So if you're interested in how to do that and get the exact equivalent answer, um, you could instead, uh, I already have this code written, um, it's in chat. This, uh, so I have different names for objects. So king flag would be king SEA um, for you all would result in the exact same um, result but without relying on that knowledge about times counted. So what I did here is I removed all the rows with registered voters and the rows with times counted. I then grouped by the precinct of the race and just summed the total counts of votes in each precinct race. And that actually returns the exact same number, 485. In this case, I've done it for all three races, but um, you, you can filter to the US president, vice president, you get the same result. I see. Yeah, watching you do it, I'm understanding. I'm following along. I think I was having a hard time kind of trying to logic it out on my own, but. Yeah, it's I complicated. Yeah, this was the answer that I was thinking of. And my brain didn't want to get there. So I'm glad that yeah. we talked through this one because it was a lot. <laughs> it was exactly, nice. exactly the same thing. Assuming you take the second one and filter to U.S. President, Vice President, you get the exact same result. But um, you know, it's neat because it's actually what's great about it is the top one is sort of getting at this thing using. Um, uh, I see. I haven't calculated turnout in that bottom one yet either. So you'd have to then um, pull the registered voters back in. So the bottom one actually also then requires a left join, which makes it much more awkward because I have to get the registered voters back, join it back onto that. And so I prefer oh, yeah, the top yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah. 
But there's always an infinite number of ways to solve basically any problem you encounter. And so um, I typically do whatever I notice first, unless it turns out to be a huge pain. And if it turns out to be a huge pain, I usually go back and find out a solution. But Rion was like heading toward a path that um, is a correct solution that would get you there, but as it would turn out, would take us about four more lines of code. Um, but it's an e e exactly the same thing, essentially going through this one, which would be normally what a normal person would find is their first solution probably, but at taking advantage of that little identity there that they've already summed it up for us means we can skip summing it up ourselves. And I'm lazy and I like shortcuts. That's the end of part one. So at this point you have an enormous amount of time if you just like to ask any questions or something like that. Um, yeah, that's a homework assignment that can take a long time to do by yourself, but it's honestly can be done in not that much code. Yeah, the first time I did this homework, um, when I was in this class, I did not correctly load the data in. So I spent most of the time <laughs> because a bunch of my columns had collapsed into one column, just separating them all uh, manually. That took a really long time. Don't do that. <laughs> if nobody has any questions, you're feel free to to get out of here. Uh, but we'll answer anything you got. Yep, I'm here. I'm on the clock. Um, I'm this question. error. Oh, never mind. Sorry. Um, I'm getting this error. Error problem with mutate input turnout. X is non numeric. Um, yes, um, the, there's not a back ticks um, after each of the column things. So like right here, you're missing a closing back tick um, for each of your columns. Okay, I think I got it. I just used quotes instead of back tick or a single quote. Gotcha. Um, all right, take care, Katie. Getting this error, error can't subset columns that don't exist. Column sum of count. Case hey, sensitivity. Yeah, this sum oh, of count. I'm a big proponent of all lowercase everything for this reason. An important thing to note about the errors that were shown in chat too is if you look at it, what says can't subset columns that don't exist. That's actually one of the nice useful error messages in R, unlike many of them, because it's saying that column sub count doesn't exist. That only really happens if you've mistyped a column name. The one above it that says error problem with mutate non-numeric argument to binary operator, that sounds like a completely unreadable error. It's actually not. A binary operator is, the, is something like the division symbol or plus. So it's saying you can't do math with a non-numeric thing, which tells you the things on either side of the division sign are non-numeric because they're text, they're quoted variable names instead of uh, ones with like back ticks around them. The error messages are not completely like nonsense. Um, it just takes a long time to get, get it sort of what they're trying to say. Um. Nicole, did you have a question or did I just make that up? Yeah, yeah, I, so I tried, um, let me see here. So when we were making a new column to kind of sift each of these precincts into Seattle and not Seattle, you had done it using um, character values, but I did it as like a binary zero and one Yes. Um, and then I used glimpse to just kind of see like how that worked. And it says, I was expecting it to say integer, but it still says double. And so I'm having, I'm under, trying to understand what makes it come up as like double versus integer. Um, let's see, I have a feeling about it. Let's, if I switch these to one, zero and then I throw it in a glimpse. Let's see. Yeah, it still says double. Hmm. I mean, that's not bad. Not problem. I'm just kind of curious about how it 
why it thinks that way or like how it assigns that. Yeah. Hmm. How it assigns what? How it assigns, okay, so this if else gives back a integer one and an uh, integer zero. And, but when we glimpse, it made the column a double. Um, and Nicole was just wondering why it gave back a double and not a numeric or a integer, for instance. Well, double is the default numeric for R. So if you did one L and zero L, it would come back to you as an integer. Um, if you wanted a logical, you'd have to do true and false. And then in which case you wouldn't need the DFL statement. Okay. Yeah, integer. Oh, okay. Good to know. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Yeah, you too. You too. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm heading out to, uh, I'll come back next week with many, many questions. Go for that it. good. Thank you. See you on Wednesday. Uh, I have a question with uh, knitting everything. Sure. So uh, I have like the only thing I have in the chunk settings above is cash equals true. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's my table is showing up in, let me try and see it. Yeah, it's showing up for the last table like registered voters and turnout rates, but it's not showing up for uh, like the previous ones, like filtering down the data and sorting Seattle precinct. It's only going to show stuff if you have it set to like if you don't have it assigned to something. So most likely in those higher chunks, everything's being assigned to an object. So it's not going to show them where down when you're registered voters one, you probably have some kind of you aren't assigning it to an object. And so it's just printing out it out. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense because I have it set to something. Yeah, so just assign it to an object. And if you want to display those objects, use something like head or something on the objects you've created. So if you want to show them in the document, which is a good idea in this homework assignment to just show a head, you create all the objects and then just run head on the object you've created. Okay. And um, for, for the last table, like the very last one that shows up, um, it's displaying yeah, it's display, displaying registered voters and times counted in back ticks as column names. Is there a way to fix that? In what way? Like, uh, so like it looks like like this, like but as the name of it with the back ticks included? Yes, it looks like that. Um, are they also within quotes? Um, I think, well, the only time I put it in, yeah, is I think the back ticks came from the very last line of code from mutate, but I'm not too if sure. You, if you display that in your actual console, um, the name should have the back ticks on them. Uh, so if you like print that to console, like for instance, you paste that in, you'll see it has the back ticks in the names. The names literally have the back ticks in them. It's just that our studio's display in the RMD window hides those back ticks to make it look nice. But in the RMD, when you knit, it's going to show what those back ticks most likely. Uh, okay, I see, I see. Interesting. Um, for the, like to get the tables to show from the previous questions, you said to use head. Um, or glimpse, depending, it depends how big it is. Uh, um, like. Actually, in this case, header goods will both be fine. Um, it's just ways to show it. You're never going to show the entire table because it's always got way too many rows. Uh, yeah. But anything that kind of gives you, um, lets you just display a few values. Head is nice because by default, it gives you the first six. Glimpse is nice because it shows you the first so many observations of each uh, column, but kind of puts them in row style. OK, thank you. Absolutely.